So this presentation will look at exchange in plants. There's a lot less to know really than exchange in the lungs, so it shouldn't take too long to get through. The organs of exchange in plants are leaves. During the day, as we know, they take in carbon dioxide from the surrounding air. And at night time, and also during the day, I beg your pardon, also during the day, they give out oxygen. So the sort of gas exchange that's taking place during the day in a plant is the reverse of what's happening in the lungs in many ways. The leaves are taking in carbon dioxide, it's used for photosynthesis, and they give out oxygen. Now, of course, at night time, this doesn't happen because the CO2 isn't taken in, so it's a very different set of circumstances. The key thing to notice about the leaf is that it's very flat. And this means two things. It means by f when we flatten objects, we give them a bigger surface area. But also, there's less distance for the gases to diffuse through to either get into or out of the leaf for exchange. Let me explain what I mean by looking at a cross-section through the leaf. So here is that cross-section. You can see that nowhere in the leaf is very far from the outside. Because it's so flat, when the carbon dioxide goes in, it really doesn't have very far to get to travel to to get to the palisade cells where it's needed. And equally, oxygen doesn't have very far to travel out to leave. So the flattened shape of the leaf gives it a bigger surface area, but also means there's not very far for the gases to diffuse. Let's summarise the key aspects of the leaf, their adaptations for exchange, in the same that we did for the lungs. Firstly, leaves have a large surface area. It's their flat shape that gives them this large surface area. Secondly, the flattened shape means that they have a thin surface. So, um, so nowhere is too far away from the outside world. The distance for the carbon dioxide to travel through is low, as is the distance for oxygen to travel back. A third interesting point is that they have a good transport system. When water is exchanged, as it is between the xylem and the palisade cells for photosynthesis, every part of the leaf is close to a vein containing xylem to enable it to have that exchange process going on easily. Now, water's a bit of a red herring here, here because we're talking mostly about exchange gases, but it is worth mentioning at this point that there is also a good transport system in leaves. And fourthly, I've called it ventilation there, and it was probably a bad idea, but fourthly, the plants do have stomata to enable gaseous exchange. The stomata are the pores, on the, mostly on the lower surface here, that allow gases in and out of a leaf. So if you're after asking the exam for the adaptations of a leaf for exchange, I would say the flattened shape gives it A, a big surface area, B, it means that there's not far for the gases to diffuse when they get into or out of the leaf, so the CO2 and O2 don't have far to travel. And thirdly, I'd mention the stomata, that they are there to allow gases into and out of the leaf. So those are the three big ones, I would say. It has a large surface area because it's flat. No gases, the gases don't have to travel very far because it's flat. And the stomata are there to allow the gases in and out for exchange. On the subject of stomata, here are two, just to highlight what their job is. The one on the left here is in the light, and the stoma, the air pore, is open there. It's open because the guard cells have taken in water and swollen up. As they swell up, they push each other apart. Now this is great because in the light, of course, what we want is carbon dioxide to be able to get into the leaf for photosynthesis. So this works really well. During the day, the light starts photosynthesis, the guard cells swell up, and carbon dioxide can get in to be used for photosynthesis. But in the dark, photosynthesis stops. You might think, well, so what? What's the point in closing the stoma? Well, the reason is that at night, if the stoma remained open, the plant would lose water. So by closing the stoma, the plant conserves water. It keeps water inside the leaf for use in photosynthesis the next day. So the stomata open during the day, they close at night. They open in the day to let the carbon dioxide in, they close at night to conserve water. Now moving down to the, the roots, and here's a structure that we met way back at the beginning of the course. The cells, or some of the cells, that line the roots have these long structures called root hair cells, here. 
the root hairs extend into the soil and they give a big surface area, a huge surface area. If the root hairs are damaged, the plant will probably die because it won't be able to take in water rapidly enough. They give a bigger surface area for water to enter by. The water moves in by osmosis. They also allow minerals to be moved in from the surrounding soil as well. So minerals that the plant might need can also get in, though they tend to be taken in, they're pumped in, they're dragged in, if you like, by active transport. But either way, the root hair increases the surface area, whether it be for water to get in by osmosis, or for minerals, mineral ions, to get in by active transport. Whichever way you look at it, the root hair cell is doing its job. It's increasing the surface area for transfer of water or mineral ions. Now we get on to the key part of this presentation, really. I want you to understand how water moves up plants. And the story begins, well, it begins in two places, really, because I've already mentioned that water moves into the roots by osmosis. So we know that down here, the water is moving in by osmosis. We know that. The root hair cells are there to increase the surface area for that to happen. But the water can only travel so far into the roots by osmosis. Eventually, it will stop. It has to be taken the rest of the way up the plant using a different system. And thankfully, there is something called transpiration that does this. In the leaves, water is constantly lost during the day through the stomata, like this. The water is moving out of the stomata. Now, the evaporation of water from leaves is called transpiration. That's what that word means. Transpiration is the evaporation of water from leaves. As the water evaporates, it pulls more water behind it. In the same way that a siphon works, as one water molecule is lost, it drags another one behind it. So the water is dragged up the stem in the airtight xylem vessels by the water that's evaporating. It's a really weird concept, I know. But as the water evaporates into the air, it pulls more water up the xylem behind it. It's important that the xylem tubes are airtight, otherwise this system breaks down. So transpiration is the evaporation of water from leaves. As the water evaporates, it pulls more behind it up the xylem vessels in the stem. It sounds complicated, but it's actually a very simple idea, and it serves plants well. Even the tallest trees drag their water up by this cohesion the, the sticking together of the water molecules in the xylem vessels. The flow of water up the xylem, the constant flow of water up the leaf, is called the transpiration stream. So what we're seeing here is the transpiration stream as the water constantly moves up. It evaporates into the air, pulls more water up behind it like that, the transpiration stream. Now we can observe transpiration using this device. It's called a potometer. It looks complicated, but the idea is very simple. We take a leaf of a plant, or a leafy shoot, I should say, of a plant. He, oops, just here. There it is. And um, we put that into this sort of well of water. It has to be cut under water, otherwise air gets into the xylem and the whole process stops. As the water evaporates from the leaves in transpiration, it draws more water into the stem. The water is pulled along. And by monitoring what this air bubble does here, we can see how quickly, let's do a white air bubble, shall we? Here we go, let's see if I can. As the air bubble moves along, like this, you can see how transpiration is progressing. Eventually it gets to there and you undo this little reservoir here to reset the air bubble back to the beginning again. But we can see transpiration at work. As the water evaporates from the leaves, it pulls up more water from the potometer, the air bubble travels, and we can see how quickly transpiration is occurring by how rapidly that air bubble moves. It's a simple idea. What can we do to increase the rate of transpiration? Well, we can blow air across the leaf. If we were to, to put a fan in this and blow air across it, that would speed it up. So air currents speed up transpiration. The bubble would move faster. We could also warm up the surroundings. In warmer temperatures, 
the bubble moves faster because water evaporates from the leaves more quickly. We can also lower humidity. If we dry out the air around the plant, then again it loses more water. And fourthly, we can shine light on the plant. By shining light on the plant, transpiration speeds up because the stomata open more. It's worth remembering those factors that affect transpiration. The way I always remember them is by thinking about washing hanging on a line. These three definitely relate to that because on, on good days for drying your washing, it's windy, it's warm and it's a dry day. There's no moisture in the air. And so all of those things speed up transpiration. So all of those things speed up transpiration. Light is a little bit harder to explain. Of course, shining a light on your washing doesn't make much difference, but it does affect transpiration because it opens the stomata. Now, the one that's most holding back the rate of transpiration is called the limiting factor. And we spoke about these with photosynthesis a little bit, didn't we? So on certain days, um, for example, if it's a cold day, then the warmth will be limiting the rate of transpiration. On a really still day, then the lack of air currents might be limiting the rate of transpiration. So the same rules of limiting factors apply. But basically, what I would take from this slide here is making sure that you know what the transpiration stream is, the flow of water through the plant, and make sure that you know the factors that affect the rate at which that happens. As long as you've got that, I'll be happy. Now I've mentioned already that stomata close during the night to conserve water and you could do with knowing how else the leaf is adapted to restrict the loss of water. We've spoken about how it's adapted for taking in um, carbon dioxide earlier, about it being flat and having a large surface area and having those stomata and some of those things apply again. So how does a leaf reduce the water loss? Well let's have a look. Firstly by having this waxy cuticle as the top layer. It is a kind of waterproofing layer of the plant, not to stop water getting in, but to stop water escaping. So the waxy cuticle is a great device for reducing water loss in the plant. Secondly, by having stomata that can close, we can limit the amount of water loss during the night. So a waxy cuticle and the fact that we can close stomata are both important. And thirdly, in really dry weather, plants wilt. And when they wilt, they kind of hang their leaves and the stomata automatically close. So three ways that plants reduce water loss, by having a waxy cuticle on their top surface, by having stomata that can be closed, and by wilting in really dry weather. And that completes this presentation on exchange in plants. To summarise, we've seen the adaptations of leaves for gas exchange, the fact that they are flat, gives them a bigger surface area and a short distance for gases to travel, and they have stomata as well. We've spoken a bit about the importance of stomata and how the fact they can close at night to conserve water. We've looked at root hair cells and the importance of them, their huge surface area in taking in water by osmosis and minerals by active uptake. We've defined transpiration as the loss of water from leaves, the evaporation of water from leaves. And we've spoken about the factors that affect transpiration. Warmth, dry air, air currents and light intensity. And that completes this short presentation on exchanging plants. Thank you for watching. I'll see you next time.